What up? Welcome to Homegrown Hustle, where local brilliance takes the center stage. I'm your host, Matt Eichmann. Together, we're about to embark on an inspiring journey. Our community thrives on the wisdom of insightful leaders that are right here in our backyard. And we're bringing their expertise to your ears. Whether you're an aspiring entrepreneur or simply seeking inspiration, this podcast is your guide. Join us every week in celebrating innovation, guidance, and the power to inspire greatness. Let's explore the stories that shape our local business landscape, and together, let's ignite the spark of excellence. What's up? I'm Matt Eichmann here with Russ Haynes, the founder of the Invisible Wounds Project. Invisible Wounds Project is an awesome organization based right here in Forest Lake. They are looking to help with mental health within the first responder community. Russ has a big heart and his vision for this is something that's truly inspiring and is impacting a lot of lives. So I'm super excited to talk to you here, Russ. Thanks for joining us. Let's just dive right into it and like, let's talk about where Invisible Wounds kind of came from. Yeah. So, well, thanks for having me. My Um, pleasure. Yeah. So Invisible Wounds Project, we've, we work with our military, police, fire, EMS, frontline medical staff corrections, dispatch, and then their families related to mental health and PTSD and suicide issues. Our mission statement is to positively impact and enhance the lives of those who serve or served, just to keep it shorter. Because when we got into all the other, all the lines and stuff like that, it got a little long. But we've been around doing stuff since 2009. Mm -hmm. So it started as a car truck motorcycle cruise. Um, I wanted to pay tribute to my dad and raise some money for veteran causes. And there was like 12 cars and 25 people in a parking lot. And we did that always, you know, in September. And and we do this event just to raise some money. So first year, like I said, it was small. It grew and grew over time. We were under the umbrella of another military charity for a while. But then as it as it grew, at that same time, I had been police officer, corrections officer, and 911 dispatcher. And then in 2015, I really started to struggle a lot with my mental health Mm -hmm. and PTSD. And I looked for help and I couldn't find any because I'm not a veteran. You know, there was nothing available for someone who was like me. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really struggled. I was at that point, I was also, you know, having suicidal ideation and luckily I made it through. And 2016, I left public safety after, you know, 17 years, I kind of struggled For a while, I I got into sales and marketing because it was something that I recognized that I enjoyed doing Mm -hmm. as working on the nonprofit side. I liked connecting people, connecting businesses, doing sales and sponsorships and stuff. So I got into sales marketing with a radio station, did that, but there was always you know, a desire to do more to help people. And then so we we developed Invisible Wounds Project out of that. And it's it's grown into something much bigger to where we're helping hundreds, if not thousands of people every year. And now we have awesome support center that we're mm-hmm. building here in Forest Lake. That's a one of a kind facility that really does not exist anywhere in this country. Um, our mission is pretty interesting because we not only do we work with veterans, but then we work with what we call all the first responder roles. So I think as a public, we understand that that there's you know PTSD and suicide and all this trauma from veteran side of it, and you know we expect that we send mm-hmm. them off to war and, and and things like that, and and they do and see and experience a lot of things, but we don't expect and we don't understand on the public side is how deeply impactful what our police and fire and EMS and frontline medical staff corrections dispatch what they do. And then we also don't ex- understand how it impacts the families. There's very little effort or not not a lot of effort, not a lot of money put into helping on that regard. I, I feel like as a society, we rea- we're very reactive. You know, if somebody dies, it's, it's far easier to raise money or, you know, give in that mm-hmm. case. Like, hey, this person's now dead. We'll mm-hmm. help with funeral costs. Mm-hmm. We're really looking to take a much bigger upstream approach and try to 
try to keep people healthy. Yeah, let's um, prevent this, huh? Prevent death and, and prevent negative things. You know, I, I think, you know, all of the groups that we serve, you know, the old, the old guard was, you know, just pick up your, you know, pick yourself up by the bootstraps and keep going and suck yeah, it up. Rub and, some grass on it. And, and that, that going. just doesn't, sounds good. It doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't just keep burying all this stuff. So in, invisible wounds is a, this really started a conversation around PTSD, which is something that's kind of thrown around a lot. So you're working with veterans and then with first responders, all of which are kind of like the superheroes, like within our society, right? They go and they have these roles where they're running into fires and they're, yep. they're going into these situations. You can't even really depict in movies and, yeah. and stuff like that, right? I mean, they're, they're the people who are, our people are the ones that are running towards things, doing mm -hmm. things that 95% of the public will never mm -hmm. experience, or they might experience it one time in their life. I'll, I'll give you an example that really drove it home for me this this past weekend. Um, I was part of a a nursing huddle at a, at a local major trauma center, and so I was talking to them about Invisible Wounds Project, what we do, and and how we help people. These nurses are just coming on to shift, and nurses are a group that kind of get forgotten. Mm -hmm. We don't. We, they're behind the scenes. They, yep. you know, they're not seen. They're not out arriving in the squad car, the ambulance mm -hmm. or the fire truck, any of that. So they're a little bit behind the scenes, but so I, I'm talking to them. And at that same time, I'm, I'm talking to them about mental health and, and all the, all the things that like we do and, and how we can help. It's the beginning of their 12 hour shift and they have a call come in that is, they're getting paged to go to the, the stabilization room mm -hmm. because they have a, one with a gunshot wound coming in, they have one coming in with a knife wound to the neck. Okay. And that's the beginning of their shift. And as I'm talking to them about mental health, I'm, I'm thinking in the back of my head, this is what they're walking into. This is what their day is starting like. This is, that is what our people, that is, that is what they experience, you know? And if, if that's what they're experiencing, you know, on a, and, and that's just a regular day. That, yeah. That's that's not something abnormal for someone that works in a level one trauma center to have mm -hmm. that be part of your day. How many normal, normal, regular public <clears throat> people experience stuff like that? I mean, it doesn't, yeah. especially not like just at the beginning of a shift on a Thursday or whatever it right. is, right? So like because it's a, such a small number of those individual individuals that actually have those experiences. I, I think it's forgotten a little bit until it starts to impact all those other lives that those, those people touch. Right. Um, but we can like get in front of all of that with some type of conversation and communication around it and like training for it at some degree, whether it's like going into that field or like, I guess, how do we, how do we invoke change long term to actually like? Well, so it it starts with making the conversation okay to have the conversation, okay to not be okay. Do people like can an individual like identify that themselves when they're kind of going through that? If they're even if it's something they're not really. Yeah, I mean, so like taught. we're. Our people who, who work in this, in these fields, myself, mm -hmm. like we're aware that this is a, we're aware that this is a problem. Like bringing awareness to, bringing awareness to it for ourselves, mm -hmm. I'm aware. Now, where are the resources to help me get through it? Mm -hmm. That's where Invisible Wounds Project is different. That's where we are. We have the ability to, to make changes, mm -hmm. help make that, con help facilitate those conversations connect people to other people who, Hey, you're okay. You, we've got other people who've been there. I've been there. Our volunteers have pretty much all been there. It's okay to not be okay. We'll help you get through. We have options. We have great therapists that we work with that we can refer you to. We have great, you know, connections that we can introduce you to mentors, volunteers, peer to peer support, services outside of just therapy, but therapeutic. 
you know, one of the big things about our support center, we've got a, a woodworking shop, we've got an art studio, we've got all of these different things that are scientifically proven to help with trauma and PTSD mm -hmm. and things that our people, you know, when, when we talk about like yoga and meditation, things like that, that are maybe some of our people are like, I'm not going to do that. That sounds pretty like, that's not something I'm into. Mm -hmm. But I can get them into a woodworking shop and do woodworking activities. Yeah, meet them kind of where they're do at. Do other a things, bit. and it's scientifically it's it's a scientific fact that doing that is also also triggers areas of your brain that are triggered when you're doing meditation and yoga, and and so it it has a similar effect. Mm -hmm. It's just not, you know, how you I, tap into it. Is yeah. Differently. So and and we meet people where they're at. I mean, some people are want to do yoga. Some people so. You know, they, they want to meditate and they want to do these things, you know, and that's mm. where we, we differ. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're inventing the wheel where it needs to be invented and where there's lapses of service. There's a lot of emphasis on after people are in crisis. There's not a lot of emphasis on keeping our people healthy or preventing that crisis from happening. Why? Why? Why, like, why don't we ha I, have, that? I don't know. I, I really don't know. I, I do think it's a lot easier for us to, I, I, th I think it's a lot easier for us to see mm -hmm. the crisis a as a society. We run towards that crisis. We run towards tragedy. Okay. It's easy to see. It's easy to spot. It's not easy to see that people who are silently struggling with invisible wounds have mm -hmm. that. And, and, and it's because we haven't, as a society, it's not okay to have that conversation. We mm -hmm. all, as a public, hey, we're all here to support and we've got you. When it comes to mental health, I don't you know, believe that that's actually... A thing. Okay, right now. It's it's not it's not there right now. Because it's hard, because there's like so much emotion involved, right? right? So so how do we continue down that path to hopefully find a destination where it is more okay? I mean you're doing we have to a just lot continue to continue to have that conversation. We mm -hmm. have to have that conversation. We have to have people be willing mm -hmm. to share where they're at. Mm -hmm. And, and we have to have, it starts at the top. We have to have our leaders in departments, in the government mm -hmm. actually care, not just lip service. Cause lip service is one thing. And there's lots of politicians and leaders that will give lip service. There's a lot fewer who will actually do the right thing. When I go out and speak to departments and, and speak to people and leaders you know, one of the things I always say is how you how you treat the person that comes forward and asks for help and is looking for help and services, how you treat them is being watched by your other people. Mm -hmm. The person who's brave enough to say, hey, I need help. Can you help me? Here's, you know, here's what I'm dealing with. If you treat them poorly or if you don't handle it right, your other people are watching. Mm -hmm. And if, if you, if you treat them poorly, your other people who are struggling like them, and there are going to be people who are watching and, and, and seeing how you do it. If you do it bad, the, those people who are sitting watching are not going to come forward. Yeah. That person who came forward might be fine. They might mm -hmm. find help somewhere because they're advocating for themselves. The people who watch, you kind of run them mm -hmm. through maybe the ringer, they're, they're not going to come forward. They're gonna say it's it's not okay yeah, to be not okay. Do anything if it if they do come forward. The, yeah. There's not the help's Other not gonna than, be provided. Well, what hap What we see a lot is is that these individuals, you know, if they do come forward and they're at that type of a facility or that type of a mm -hmm. employer or whatever, they kind of get pushed out. That's where we are a great resource for people because they can come to us. We can get them into help. We can get them into therapy, get them into all these different services. Their employer doesn't need to know. We're not required to report to their employer and say, Hey, we're seeing, you know, officer Julie over here, or officer John or whatever. We don't have to report that. So, so it's almost like there has to, like that third party makes it so that it, 
I mean, if the resources are there in a third party form, maybe that can actually like help provide resources moving forward. I'm just trying to think about like I like clearly identifying a problem like this, be able to present it to those that can actually make decisions around change at like a government level. Like I'm sure you've had conversations there. Like, is there information that like we don't currently have that would help us like so we're going to be doing an event in October mm-hmm. at our facility. Um, we're going to do a screening of a, of a video, a documentary called PTSD 911. We're going to be doing that screening and we're going to be inviting, we're going to be inviting leaders into view that. Mm-hmm. And we're going to have a panel of, of experts that take part in that and discuss this stuff. Because it is, some of it is they don't understand it. So it's our job to help educate and provide those resources. The other side of it is they maybe don't know how to deal with it. They might not understand. They might not realize it's mm-hmm. a, it, it is a problem. Because it's not talked about. It's not something that is everywhere. It took years and years for the military to figure some stuff out. And even a lot of that, they would still say, is not figured out well. On the other lines of mm-hmm. it, we're way behind yeah i mean it's it's so interesting like ptsd is something that so i mean post-traumatic stress disorder like it so we've all heard that before what is that like like what's the diagnosis for that i guess for for the like i don't have a clear definition of it in my mind but like when you think about it what do you what do you think well i mean it's i don't have the clinical diagnosis but it is it is I mean, you're, everyone has different like reactions, but so like, I mean, anger, anxiety, you know, anger, anxiety, depression, there's a lot of things Mm -hmm. that go into it. Constantly vigilant. There's a lot of lack of sleep. There's, you know, there's extramarital affairs and and risk taking and there's so much that goes into it. I mean, it's it's a very complex thing, but mm-hmm. it is it is something that deeply impacts. If you don't deal with it, it deeply mm-hmm. impacts all of life. And, and and then all these other things are really symptoms of like that trauma. Yeah, of of not dealing with that trauma, and then left untreated, it it leads to a lot of other things. Mm-hmm. Leads to you know potentially suicide. I mean, and we talked off air before, mm-hmm. you know. So recently, officer. Jamal Mitchell with Minneapolis police was shot and killed on, on May 30th. Since then we've had three nurses locally die of suicide, a deputy and a medic firefighter, you know, Hmm. nobody knows about those really. I mean, it's very quiet. It's not something that's broadcast out there. And a lot of times that, that comes down to just, you know, families, not laying it out there for everyone sometimes there's the shame there's the there's the guilt Mm of ah we we should have done something more we should have known i mean we had a client one of our clients is one of those five people who we've worked with he's worked with multiple other organizations i had conversations with like three people who had talked to him within 12 hours of the suicide they didn't know anything was going on you know and these are people that work with this stuff every day so yeah you know, sometimes it, it, we can't do everything. We can't save everybody. I've, I've sadly, I've learned that and I've, I've had to stomach that and understand that. But our job is to keep throwing the lifeline for those that are in that river. Mm-hmm. And we need them to grab that lifeline and let us help them, whether it's us or another organization, but they need to grab that lifeline because what happens is at some point they go over that dam. And they fall on the rocks and and they might live, but it's a lot harder to put somebody back together and it's never going to be the same at all when they, when they go over that dam and that crisis point. So with the mission, like positively impact the life of the lives of those who serve or served, like how, what are some of the ways that you've been able to impact those individuals? So, I mean, we meet people where they're at. It's not always the same for everybody. Everyone has a little different path, mm-hmm. right? So we, we meet people where they're at. Some of them need therapy. Some of them don't. Some of them just need connection to other people. And, and then a combination thereof. We get referrals from therapists who are working with 
people that mm-hmm. will benefit by working with us in other capacities. The support center is, it's just a life changing mm-hmm. thing because we have, you know, it's a, it's like a community center for our people. It's a place where they can go. Nobody's ever going to ask, you know, what's the worst thing you've ever seen. That's nothing we would ever ask there. We've all seen stuff. We all understand mm-hmm. it. That's not something that is part of the conversation. That is something, however, that might be part of the conversation somewhere else. So it's a safe space for us and for our people. Again, it's it, there's a focus on the arts and connection. So we've got woodworking, an art studio. We've got, you know, we're going to be doing music things there. We've got a laser room. The lounge that we have there is, you know, pool table, dartboard, bubble hockey, a coffee bar. It's a way for people to interact and connect in a healthy way. That's not that's not the bar, which mm-hmm. is kind of our <clears throat> our our people's knee jerk reaction. You know, bad day, bad shift. All right, hey, we're it's okay. We can go drink. Mm. That's not what we're about. We're about providing healthy healthy you know influence and like outlets and community around all of that. So. So what you've done since 2018 is pretty amazing. And like with this facility, you're you're really just getting started, right? So tell me a little bit about the vision that you have for the Invisible Wounds project in the next five to 10 years and some of the hurdles that you're going to have to overcome to achieve that. Yep. So we're ever evolving Mm -hmm. and there's no playbook for this. So we've, we've had to learn. You're how, making one as you we, go. We, you know, we're building, we call it building the plane as we fly mm-hmm. a little bit because we've had to learn on the go. I was a police officer, corrections officer, 911 dispatcher. I was not a therapist. I, mm-hmm. you know, I've now surrounded myself with smarter people than myself to help guide where we're going. But there was a time where we, all we did was just provided access to that therapy. We got them in touch with therapists. We paid for the therapy. And, you know, we realized while doing that, that that was completely unsustainable because we had, because we were paying for all the bills we had at the beginning of 22, we had 19, no, 16 people a month in January Hmm. that we were paying for therapy. That was manageable. By the end of 22, as the word started to spread about who we were, what we were doing, we had over 90 people. Oh, goodness. Well, the bills were... That was a lot. I mean, we we grew like mm. 500%. Well, financially, you can't grow yeah. that fast. That's almost impossible. We don't have government funding. We don't have massive grants. So it's all fundraising. It's all sponsorships and donations. So we do a lot of events to make that work. So we realized, too, that a lot of these people had access to their insurance. They just didn't know how to get to the right spot. Hmm. They didn't want to be, you know, a test. Like, well, I'll go try this place out and see if that works. Keep testing it. So what they really needed was that access to somebody who was qualified. So we have a, a great system set up with a lot of therapists where we can get people connected really quickly. And we know it's going to be a good fit like mm-hmm. 95% of the time. And then, you know, as we've evolved, it's it's bringing in those other aspects, that other support, that ongoing support. So it's not just, okay, we're going to connect you to this therapist, give us a call back later if it's working, you know, mm-hmm. and we continue to follow up. We continue to see how else do we help get them to a better spot and, and continue to support that mm-hmm. growth. As we grow with this support center, um, that's a community, right? We're building a community of, of support for our people while also bringing like light to what's going on in, in this, this problem that we have. I envision as we grow and, you know, continue to see that need because it's not just here, it's everywhere that we would expand, but it, it comes down to finances, you know, fundraising, donors, sponsors, grants, we have it all kind of, I call it feather in the throttle because we have to. I feel like there should you know, be a first responder fund or something, though, with as many government roles as fo- like you rattled off like a half dozen different jobs that people hold. Yeah. You didn't even include nurse on there or any of the like. 
Well, our, when I say frontline medical staff, so like our nurses, mm-hmm. I mean, to me, we have done as a, as a public, we've done a poor job of, of taking care of our people. Mm-hmm. And we've, we've had a history of doing a poor job, whether yeah. it's, you know, with That's the military, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, we, we do a poor job of taking care of the people that run into things yeah. and that, that do the hard work and we got to do a better job of that. And we have to recognize that if we don't start taking care of these people, well, we're already seeing it. No, a lot of people are not going into these roles. We're mm-hmm. seeing people leave them. So we have to keep who we have healthy. And that will also encourage other people to go into that job knowing that they're going to be taken care of. But mm-hmm. if they're not taken care of, people don't want to go there. So what what can the like the general public do to like support that let's just talk like within the twin cities area at least there's been a lot going on with like george floyd and Mm -hmm. all that like there's a lot of focus here and a lot of negative focus on those first responders so Mm -hmm. like what can we as a community do to kind of help support invisible wounds but really like anybody that has that experience We, we need to continue to show support and compassion and recognize that yes there are in any role there's there's some that aren't good there Mm -hmm. there are some that are that way okay but by and large and studies have shown it over and over and over again most of these people are really good they're they're husbands fathers mothers sons daughters right they're 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 our neighbors Mm -hmm. they're the people that they're good people yeah and we need to help them and it, we need to show support, not just on the bad days, not just when someone's dead or when there's crisis. We need we need to continue to show support and compassion on the good days well, when, when things aren't horrible. Well, and I think as a community, like just simply understanding that we may never fully comprehend what it is that those individuals have to experience day in and day out. So to be able to cast some of the judgment and like negative conversation around it. Like it, we, we don't have a lot to go off of. Um, and really it doesn't help anybody long term. I mean, we've seen some of the negative effects here locally, but I think communities of people talking about this and then the other communities who maybe don't know it, but are willing to like learn because they see how it can kind of impact mm-hmm. everyone in the community like all that is like, it's really powerful, Russ. I, I, I got to applaud you, man. Like doing that, like creating, creating something that's never been a thing is that's like true visionary. And, and you, you see that need and you just like, you're running just head on into it. Right. Almost like you're running into the fire to try to solve it. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's really inspiring for me. And I know there's a lot of lives that, that you're touching and, and are going to continue to tr- to touch so could you talk about a little bit like some of how the local force like business community has has supported invisible wounds and and like what it's it's been to work with the community like forest lake yeah and we've been really well received here when we decided hey we're going to build a support center we're going to put it in forest lake part of that was because we had already been working here i had great relationships with mm-hmm. other businesses you know, we've had fantastic support, financially, volunteerism, mm-hmm. all of that. I mean, the day that we started our demolition, there were people that just showed up that I had no idea were going to show up. So we were able to get our demo That's done. Awesome. You know, thanks to a couple local businesses, Olson Sewer Service and KNS Junk Removal, that they showed up and they were there and just, boom, we got it done. Sometimes that's all people need, too, is to just show up. Yep. And, you know, we had Lake Town Electric Corp, they're our electrician on this, and they had people there to help disconnect. And I didn't even ask for some of this stuff. They mm-hmm. People just showed up. And that's mm-hmm. that was huge. Running Aces is a huge supporter of us, and, and they've been with us for 10 years mm-hmm. doing stuff. So, I mean, it's it's those things that help make it work. I'm the founder and executive director, so I'm always the one who's out in front of the camera, but there's so many people behind the scenes that help make it happen. And we always, we need that army of people 
to Are they all volunteers help too, or do you have it. other employees? I or? mean, we have, so I'm a full time employee mm-hmm. and I have one intake coordinator who's 25 hours a week. Otherwise, everything is volunteer. And wow. I just became full time in, in 22 because it was, I was volunteering 30 hours a week and it was like, well, yeah. At some point, we have to shift mm-hmm. and, and, and just go. It's not always perfect. Not everything we do is perfect. Not everything I do is perfect. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we, you know, hit it out of the park. Mm-hmm. It's trying to figure out what's working, what's not, and, and trying to do our best to avoid those mistakes and pitfalls mm-hmm. by bringing in the right people to, you know, help consult with us and say, hey, this is kind of where things need to go. Looking at other models and trying to use them for our people. Mm-hmm. So is there any like research component at all? Are you talking with anybody that's doing research into the psychology of there's, it? There's some of it. We're actually going to be part of a couple different, a couple different research projects are starting now. So we're part of, we're part of a study with Florida State University that's studying PTSD and TBI and the correlation related to that. That's TBI. So traumatic brain injury. And there's, we're, going to be starting with occupational therapists next next year mm-hmm. on doing a research project with a reintegration of our people mm-hmm. into setting up a model of, of reintegration and how we can help them once they leave service return to some sort of normalcy and other service because sometimes our people just they can no longer do the job that they mm-hmm. thought they were going to do rather than discarding them continuing to give them a purpose helping them find their new purpose in life and, and and be able to provide. Um, Isn't there some level input? of obligation that these governmental entities have to assume? And maybe we're getting off into some well, like a tough conversation. I, I but can like, tell you that. So here, here's the deal. I I hear here here's where the disparity is between veterans and then our all the other people that we mm-hmm. serve. And, and again, they they do a really poor job on the veteran side. However, they do an even worse job on the first responder side. If that's even possible, right? So on the veteran side, I hear commercials of, hey, you know, you qualify yeah. for this, apply for this, apply for that, do this, do that. If someone has mental health struggles and, and PTSD on the first responder side, they have to fight tooth and nail to get anything. They have to go into lawsuits. They have to there's no all organiz- of that stuff. There's it no is, organization to support it. No. We're, no, we're no it along with a couple other, or... we're it along with a couple other local organizations and, and there's other national ones, but I mean, for the most part, no, they are a lot of times left to figure it out. And that's where we're trying to help. We don't want people to leave service. They don't want to leave service, but what happens is if they say they have a problem, a lot of times they're forced to leave. Well, they work them out. But in, and inevitably, like at some point, people have to retire and there's still going to be life after employment. Yeah. Like everyone's not yep. ending in death, right? right. So, yep. so yep. at some point, there has to be some type of reintegration training or like some type of pivot from like a government or organizational standpoint to make sure these people that just served and like gave their, their er, er, like peak earning years to serving a community. Yeah. To just like have them like fall off the map and be disregarded and then also have these like visible wounds. Um, yeah. So you have the that's brotherhood. That's just not right. Like it, yeah. it's, it kind of pissed me off a little bit. Yeah. But. So on the military side, they're, they've they learned, okay, we have to do a better job of reintegrating. In 2003, when you came back from Iraq or Afghanistan, it was like, okay, don't go spend too much time at the bar. Now that's, it's, that's the Now it's different. Right. So they, they have changed that aspect and they work to towards better health. It's not perfect, but they're at least doing something right. Their goal is to keep people healthy so that they can continue to serve the first responder side. And I say first responder, meaning pretty much everybody else we serve, right? It's not that way. There's no reintegration of, Hey, you've just, you've just spent 25 years working basically in a dumpster fire. Okay. Congratulations, thanks. Here's your cake. See you later. There there isn't that reintegration. And and there's not a lot of care throughout that time either. So if we don't do a better job of taking care of people during their job and after, mm-hmm. we have a problem. Yeah, we do. 
and ignoring it, it do, like ignoring it doesn't, it's it doesn't make, make the it go problem away. go away. It's been there forever. It's mm-hmm. just people are starting to realize it, so we're talking about it. This mm-hmm. would have never happened ten years ago. This conversation would have never happened. But it's starting to happen. Mm-hmm. So we're moving in the right direction. Right. Right. Yep. So like everything that's happened has happened, and we can't really change that. But what we can do is like look forward and learn from the things that have happened. So are there like are there any things that you've learned about people that are dealing with this or the families that deal with these invisible wounds that maybe you didn't fully understand yourself until you kind of started this journey? I mean, even when we think people are okay, sometimes they're not. What even is okay? Right. I mean, and it, okay is different for everybody. Mm-hmm. Being very straightforward is important. You know, how are you? I'm fine. What does fine mean? You know, do you ask people that question? Yeah. But I mean, it, it's also the follow up. Mm-hmm. Okay. Are you okay? Yeah. No. Okay. No. What's like, are you suicidal? You know, have you thought of harming yourself? Have you thought of killing yourself? Mm-hmm. Being able to ask that, knowing how to have the conversation, we get scared to ask those things sometimes because we're afraid to know what the answer is going to be. But if we don't have that straightforward conversation, we don't know the answer Mm -hmm. and our brains over here go, are they, what's going on? Like we need to be straightforward and have, have those grown up big boy, big girl conversations about where people are at Mm -hmm. and and we need to just, you know, put it out there. I, I've, I've learned that, you know, we just need to continue to offer that lifeline and that support. Eventually, they'll grab it. Mm-hmm. I can't force anyone to grab it. I mm-hmm. can do my best to, to try to talk to them. We can do our best to talk to them. But if they're not willing to accept that help, there's not a lot yeah. we're going to be able to do. I mean, we can't forcibly lock everybody up. Yeah. We can't forcibly make them do everything because it doesn't work. What we can do is show them, hey, other people who have been there, done that, who have been in your shoes, they've been able to get out. And you can too. We have to offer hope. Here's some case studies. Here's some resources. Here is just somebody to to show up and understand that, like, you can get through this. Like, Mm -hmm. it's it's the beginning of something that I think is going to be... Huge, and it's going to touch a lot of lives, but there's going to be a lot more support that you're going to need from like increasing financial support to volunteers, and I'm sure more growth internally within the the staff. So, how are you? Like, do you have a plan for how you're going to go about that, or is it kind of just happening? As I mean, you're going? our goal is to. We're, we're looking at hiring someone for the center now to mm-hmm. help be like a, a center director and they would, they would be an assistant. And then mm-hmm. it, it's just based on funding when we can start adding additional positions. I'd love to embed a therapist into our space, not a place where like mm-hmm. you go and sit on the couch and, and, and have a regular 9am mm-hmm. every Tuesday hour long appointment with them. That therapist is there if you need a touch, you mm-hmm. know, they're, they're working in the wood shop. They're working in the art studio. They're playing foosball with you. They're making coffee. They're, they're just a part of the atmosphere so that when, when that conversation does need to happen or someone does need that touch, they're there to give it right then. That that's a key position. Um, mentorship and support, ongoing support, checking in on people. That's the thing that can be done with volunteers that are properly trained and then also having, you know, a case manager approach. So these are all things that we're looking looking to add in the future, mm-hmm. but it really all comes down to funding. I mean, we're probably getting pretty close to being able to fully complete the center and mm-hmm. start with most of the furnishings and most of the the tools and things that we're going to need, but we also have to be smart and not empty out the bank account so that we can continue to move forward. Because I mean, it's a, it's an amazing organization, but it still has to function like a business. It's a business. It is a business. And that's something that when there's such an emotional connection and tie, like that's deep within so many lives, like you kind of forget that like, Hey, everything costs money. And like, that's not a fun thing to talk about either when you're also talking about these really, yeah, 
Yeah. Like deep emotional. Yeah. I mean, so. Yeah. I mean, Let's if I had about, a money. We're going to talk about money right now. If, if I had a money tree, I mean, things, mm-hmm. we could do a lot more. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, money does solve, solve some things with an organization like ours for sure. Well, and it can speed things up yeah. too. So when it comes to donations and funding, like when your organization gets donations, like how does it go about allocating that and identifying like where the spend has to be? Yep. So, I mean, our, we've continued to shift to where the needs are, right? Mm -hmm. So the building, getting that up and running, then providing those services, you know, there's, there's still a massive need for us to do other things outside of that building, Mm -hmm. but it's, you know, it's the next step. It's hindered, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I've got, we get financial requests that we would love to be able to help on the financial request side, but well, how about We're not let's make a financial request right here. So financially, do you, does Invisible the Invisible Wounds project like have a goal for like fundraising for 2024 or for for this year? So the support center alone is a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar build that is all done through fundraising donors and sponsors. All of that is paid for with cash, basically. Amazing. Like, which is awesome that we have great support like that. But As you, just, we continue to, you had to spend three hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? Like you had it, now right? You don't, and then, so. and then some of that, like, I mean, we have a big event. Well, mm-hmm. it costs us money to put on our, the event. To put on the event. I mean, we have a we have a event called Freedom Fest where we have national country artists come in. We have to pay them. They don't. They're not they like, don't oh, just yep, volunteer we'll to fly this one. in. This one's on the house. I mean, because ultimately, there's there's great causes. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of nonprofits, right, that want to do events mm-hmm. and that maybe do events like that. They can't donate every single show it's and a then business, still yeah. pay their their mm-hmm. band. And I, I don't know if you know this, but people who are in a band in a national country act or any any like musician, they're not, it's not like they're rolling in you know, a million dollars a year to be mm-hmm. a guitar player in a band. Yeah. If, if they're not the artist and even if they are the artist, some of them now are, it, it's, there's, there's work to be done. Mm-hmm. They have support staff. So it's part of, it's, they're part of a business. They're right. just the business of Kenny Chesney or yeah. whatever yep. it is. So we have to pay, they have to pay, everybody's got to pay for mm-hmm. stuff. So, you know, our therapists, I, they would all love to volunteer, but they all have to put food on the table. We all have to put food on the table. Mm-hmm. We all got to take care of our own selves and the and others. And so, we have this this problem here that we're trying we to have solve. A massive so how do we problem. cooperate yeah. all together? So I mean, so our goal, what you would ask, but yeah. our goal this year is we need to raise seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, and that is what that that's what our budget looks like for the year. So we're. We're, I'm going to set a goal of a million, but that's cool. You, So we're going to help we you raise it. Yeah. So we're going to, I mean, 750, that's what you're shooting for. Push goal, like let's go for a million. Mm-hmm. So like I believe in the local communities in Minnesota, and I know that there's a lot of lives out there. So other than these events you're doing and that, like like the businesses that are listening to this and are want to help us hit this this goal with you, like what's the best way for them to to get in contact and figure out how to like really help. The, I mean, you can be, we're all over the place. Invisible Wounds Project is on, you know, Facebook, Invisible Wounds Project, our website, iwproject.org. And mm. really just setting up a meeting that way. I would mm-hmm. love, I meet with people all the time, all day, evenings, whatever. Yeah, you when, are, man, you are. When, when people come and see what we're doing and, and, and I can share some of those much deeper mm-hmm. and, and darker pieces that we're working with. Mm-hmm. I mean, they understand it. It's usually an easy yes, because I mean, we're, like I said, so we're, we're helping hundreds, if not thousands of people. And I was just last yeah. week, I was talking to a group that's 250 people that we're going to be providing services for. Well, there's 16 fortune 500 companies in Minnesota. So I, th- I think between that and like the thriving business community at like a million or 750, like I think that's a good start, but I think I'm we can hopeful. get a lot more than that. I'm hopeful. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, I look at it, we continue to grow. Well, you got to fill you know? your bucket, man. Cause like you're the type of guy that you, you're just like, you're scooping out of your bucket and, and you're helping other people. And like, 
the more that's in in your bucket or any individual who wants to give back in their bucket, the money, the more you can impact and, and like the farther it can go. And then now there's future generations that can be impacted, potentially generations that wouldn't be there without this impact. Absolutely. Right? I mean, by us helping who are helping, mm-hmm. I mean, we're, we're helping change, you know, not only are we helping that individual, we're helping that family change. Mm-hmm. We're there to support the family. That's one aspect that really gets lost a lot mm-hmm. of times. We're we're changing the the conversation within that family mm-hmm. and, and the the avenue that that family might be going down. I mean, to lose a father or a mother or, or husband even like or a, a divorce wife. or something to like, come from some type of trauma. Absolutely, like all and, of and, that. and there's a lot of divorces that happen, and, and there's just so much brokenness that comes from those that we serve. So to help keep that together is critical. And we need a bunch of money to do that, right? We do. So, I mean, we're a huge supporter at Abracadabra of Invisible Wounds. I'm so excited for you guys moving in over here. Um, I know you're going to be doing lots of big things, but I'm going to make like a personal initiative to, to help you hit that million dollar goal that I set for you. You can, you keep your goal. I'll, I'll set. <laughs> well, I uh, love it. And then, we're just going to drive towards that this year. And like, this is something that impacts like the inner workings of our communities. And so I'm incredibly passionate about the communities we serve. So like what a, what a big heart you have Russ and like stick to itiveness. Cause I know it's like not easy to like handle all that on the like human and the emotional side with, with the people that you're serving and then also have to drive this organization forward while still being able to like pay your own bills at home. Like that's a, that's a lot to navigate. So, so what I know about you is like, you're a really special person and there's more than just, there's more than just hustle that's driving you. Like there's like real passion to create change. And I just love that it's right here in Forest Lake. So like what else can, can we as a a business community do besides donating money um, to support invisible wounds or, other organizations like that. Yeah. Help us spread the word, help us, you know, volunteer. I -hmm. mean, you you can get involved with, with time, money and, and just support, you know, there's ways to take action and, and outside of just giving money where mm -hmm. it's, you know, motivating your, your employees to get Mm -hmm. involved in different ways, employee giving and, matches and there's just mm-hmm. so many different things that you can do you know encouraging people giving people time to come volunteer get involved and and that that's it's, just, it's community there. that's what it's all about it well and it's this whole ecosystem and unfortunately like those roles those first responder roles in, in our society and culture like kind of have to have them right they're not going Absolutely. anywhere so let's start getting in front of these issues as far as like donations and all that like is there like online portal where individuals yeah. can yep. donate to if there's somebody yep. out there that's passionate about it yeah and that's well, easy on our website there's a mm-hmm. donate button where you can go and and donate mm-hmm. and you can become you know you can do recurring you can do one time so lots it, of different ways when it comes to like the nonprofit side of things like is there anything that you've learned about running a nonprofit that someone out there who has kind of a passion similar to what you have that maybe you could give them some pointers or tips on? Well, you have to be passionate, understand too, that it is a business and that sometimes you have to make really, really hard decisions because Mm. we all have great ideas and we Mm -hmm. all have compassion usually for what we're trying to do, but we also have to have to have it be manageable and, and something that we can successfully navigate with a plan and so money has to be a focus money is going to have to be a focus more than likely based on Mm -hmm. unless you're doing something that doesn't require any money but you you have to be able to motivate other people Mm -hmm. you have to be able to do like you have to be able to talk to people at in different aspects and different levels you have to have someone that can do that like different skill sets and like yeah. I think just there's a sim- multitude of skill sets I, that are needed and and you aren't always going to be good at everything so you need to find people who are good at what you're not good at well, and build that team and I, the 
Passion's not going to do it all, but it can get you a long freaking yeah. way, right? You work um, really hard. You might run into more walls than others, mm-hmm. but you know, eventually maybe you figure it out, but it's still going to always be, you're going to need to find the right people to also be in your boat. And, and be able to articulate the vision and the goal that you have and get them to support that. Obviously, there's there's lots of great causes out there that could use fundraising, but being able to articulate that, like if you're passionate about a cause and you can't articulate it, you should probably find somebody that can help you do that because the fundraising is such a massive component yep. to it. Is it like what percentage of your time are you able to spend even on that right now? Uh, not as much as I need to. Well, that we're because freaking help you out because here, I'm working on, you know, we've got this building project. Once it's done, mm-hmm. we'll help, you know, but it's bringing other staff on to do, you know, mm-hmm. right now as the director, I think I got about 30 hats that I wear. I probably should wear about five, right? So I need to hand off certain hats. So it's finding people that you can hand those hats off to. And actually, they can run with it. And it can be volunteers. It can be paid people, but ulti- a combo. Well, ultimately, having f- full-time people there is going to allow for like more long-term sustained focus, right? And c- because yeah. volunteers, like, there's a lot of... They come and go. Well, and it's hard, and, right? Because it, it's hard to expect so much of somebody yeah. where the, this is part of their life and there is, like, other yeah. things that are important. And... Y- but you also have to like take what you can, can yep. get. But inevitably, there's going to have to be more people. The more time that's spent, the more focus on this that there is, the faster everything's going to snowball. Yep. So we we at Abracadabra and Homegrown Hustle, like we'll definitely keep talking about it, sharing it with other organizations. So if somebody listening to this knows somebody in like what type of key roles would, would it help for you to have introductions to to like kind of go up line and um, you know bigger conversations i guess really we're we're looking for people that are passionate and 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 believe in it and want to follow through Mm -hmm. um you know so i mean we've got aspects that we could use you know for marketing and just even you know some daily tasks that aren't they don't seem like a big deal but but they are you know i mean certain paperwork you know just just things that I mean the parallels with a the business. There's so many things. Everything that mm-hmm. everything that goes into running a business happens in a nonprofit. Mm-hmm. Everything, and you know, so re- I could hand out a hand hand off a million things. Mm-hmm. It's just finding people that are reliable enough to say, mm-hmm. yeah, I can give this to them, and I know it's going to get done, and I'm not going to have to worry about it. So, are there particular needs that third party organizations could help fill that would free up time or space for? Invisible wounds right now to do other things. I mean, it comes down to really bodies sometimes, right? Like we've got events and we need in order to successfully fundraise, you got to have like twelve people at that event helping. Okay, organizing that or organizing and, it, mm-hmm. going onto committees to fundraise for that. You know, mm-hmm. hey, we're gonna have a silent auction as part of this. We, How do we get people to donate need, stuff for the we silent need people auction? People who are who are willing to make that ask mm-hmm. for silent auction stuff. You know, not everybody has the same skill set. So it's really figuring out what are your skill sets and how can we plug people in and where can we plug them into there? I mean, your question is, is a little loaded because we yeah. need help everywhere. I was intentional. I mean, <laughs> I've got, you know, I'm, I'm putting cabinets in, you know, this week mm-hmm. and, you know, we've got some help with it, but we need more. We need to put the ceiling tiles back into place. You know, it, mm-hmm. it's just all those things that come up that you got to do. Mm-hmm. There's going to need to be cleaning. There's going to need to be, you know, just day-to-day stuff. So how, how do people find out what those things are? So you can go to project.org slash volunteer, and there's a volunteer application. And we're in the process, like I said, of, of hiring an assistant and a, a building director, basically. Mm-hmm. They're, part of their job is going to be coordinating volunteers, making sure that the schedules are where they're supposed mm-hmm. to be. And, uh, and that's, but, that's huge because now you can direct people in, in everyone pointed yep. in the same direction yep. makes, makes it easier for you to execute. All right. So is there anything else you want to say to local business owners, entrepreneurs that are listening about invisible wounds or 
otherwise. You know, just that this is, we are a part of the community. We're mm-hmm. doing things that really nobody else is doing. And we're not there just in time of crisis, but we're there, we're there beyond that. So once, once the smoke clears and once everybody, all the cameras shut off and go away, we're still there. And, you're, and we you're need, not planning on going anywhere. So. Right. And we need that support from mm-hmm. our community to be able to do that. And, and that comes in the form of volunteers, fundraising, all of that. Well, we're going to rally it here, man. I mean, this is just one podcast, but I'll do everything within like our capabilities to support that. Well, and I appreciate is that. Is there like a newsletter or anything like that? Yeah, that so you, you can have? sign up for a newsletter on our website, um, all of those things, and uh, you know, follow us on socials and great support us. Come out to events, even just even just coming out to events and being a part of it, helping us spread that word. You know, makes a big difference. And you got a few events coming up this year, so we'll stay tuned for that. And make sure to yeah. share it on our pages. So before I let you go here, I got one question for you that we ask everyone that comes on the Homegrown Hustle. So, in terms of your organization, like. How do you view like hustle? What does that word mean to you? I mean, it, it's just tenacity, hard work, never giving up. You get knocked down, you get back up. Keep going. Love it. Thank you. Well, Russ, such an amazing human being, really big heart, awesome organization that's really just the tip of the iceberg. It's just getting started. So can't wait to see all the cool things you're going to do here in the coming future, especially this summer with your new location here thanks again everybody everybody for joining us on the homegrown hustle podcast as always like subscribe check us out on our different social media pages we're super grateful for all the listeners and positive feedback we've been getting thanks again russ for coming on we really appreciate your time have a great rest of your day thanks you too thanks for having thanks again for joining us on homegrown hustle our local business community thrives because of the brilliant leaders right here in our backyard and it's been an absolute privilege to provide them with a platform to share their invaluable expertise stay tuned for more insight wisdom and inspiration from our local business champions don't forget to subscribe rate and review us on your favorite podcast platform together we'll continue to nurture and expand our homegrown success stories Matt Eichmann signing off till our next insightful episode.